Hello and welcome to another episode of Social Cohesion in Action. Previously, we discussed racism in the context of Guyana, and we touched on leadership and some various aspects as it relates to this trending topic. Today, we continue the conversation on racism in Guyana. I am Isen Hall, Project Officer within the Department of Social Cohesion, Culture, Youth and Sport of Ministry of the Presidency. With us today to continue this conversation where we'll be looking at stereotyping is Mr. Will Campbell, a trainer, a psychologist, and a lecturer from the University of Guyana, and Ms. Natasha Singh Lois, our program coordinator within the Department of Social Cohesion, Culture, Youth and Sport. Here is Ms. Lois. Thank you, Mr. Isan Hall. To our viewers and listeners, welcome to another episode of Social Cohesion in Action, where we will be discussing racism in Guyana. With me today is Mr. Will Campbell. Mr. Will Campbell, thank you very much for being here with us today. We discussed in another episode um, racism in Guyana, and we gave some general guidelines and an overview, and we talked a little bit about leadership. But today, let's talk specifically about three things. Racial stereotypes, political leadership within local government, and we want to keep that discussion within local government because that's important. And we want to talk about dollarization when we talk about racism in Guyana. So for us to start, let's talk a little bit about racial stereotypes in Guyana. All right. So we we grew up hearing certain things about people who are different from us. Um, and we ran with it, and we tend to paint brush all people who fit the particular description with, by these. And that, that is essentially what stereotyping is, where you, mm -hmm. you form conclusions about an entire group based on limited information. Yes. Um, so for example, and, and in order to have this discussion, we're going to have to be really plain spoken and so on. So, um, I'm hoping that our viewers understand that this is not an attempt to be offensive in any way. We just want to bring this issue out to the front so that we can deal with it. We need to, to, to unmask it, if you will, so that we know what, exactly what we're dealing with. So um, we, we grew up you know, hearing things about people who are different from us. Um, let me give you an example. You hear that them that, that them Bokman, the store in Kanaima. Yes. You know, everybody grew up hearing that. Um, we grew up, you know, hearing that black people lazy and black people, their armpits stink or, or mm -hmm. they're smelly or, you know, that kind of thing. We grew up hearing that um, the, the only coolie you could trust is a dead man, mm -hmm. is a dead one. Um, and so we, we grew up hearing those things and, and they were repeated so often, and very often it was so subtle we didn't realize that we were learning yes. it. And so whenever we're faced with somebody from that group, we assume automatically mm -hmm. because of this subliminal, if you will, message that we've been given, we assume that this person must be lazy because he's black, or this person must necessarily be untrustworthy because he or she is, is of Indian origin. Or, you know, that that person must be stupid because they are indigenous. Yes. Or, you know, those kinds of things. And, and, and that is essentially what stereotyping is. You hear things about people and so you judge them, um, you judge the entire group without getting to know any, anybody. Sure. You judge that entire group based on this limited bit of knowledge that you've been given, or, or information rather, yes. that you've been given. So we, you know, and, and the stereotyping is disruptive in a number of different ways. And one is we, we marginalize people. Mm -hmm. We push people away. We, we withdraw ourselves from people based on limited information, which very often is not even accurate. True. So it, 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 it is a problem, definitely. So as we talk about racial stereotype, we, we want to zoom in on who we are as Guyanese. Some, you will recall some of the things that we are taught, um, by the way, at home and at school. And I want to bring one concept in, and I'm, I'm going to use myself as the example here. And I would ask Mr. Campbell 
to help me to make you understand a little bit more from a psychological perspective. It is okay for my friend Patrick from Hope Town to call me Cooley Girl. We have been friends for a long time, for about 25 years, so it's okay. But it's not okay for anybody at work or, or my neighbor to call me Cooley Girl. It's something inside of me. I, I cannot explain it, but within that context, it is okay. Mr. Campbell, can you shed any light on that? Yeah, I think um, context is everything. You yeah. know, the, the context is everything. So your friend, Patrick, I am assuming, has, you have a connection. Yeah. And when Patrick says, Cooley Girl, you know that there is no negative um, he's not trying to insult you. In fact, it is, is probably a term of endearment. Yes. When he calls you Kuli Girl, he is saying to you and to everybody who hears, mm -hmm. I have a connection with this person. We are mm -hmm. good friends. And you're acknowledging his, his, his um, calling out to you that in that way. is saying that we're good. Yes. We can move past this thing that ordinarily would be an insult. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 in, in effect, that's a term of endearment. Mm -hmm. But if I, who, you know, don't know you very well, just come up and, and call you Kuli Girl, that comes across as an insult because the, the original meaning mm -hmm. of that term is not complimentary. Right. And we don't have the relationship, we don't have the context that would make it okay. So, you call me a black man, that's one thing. If you call me black man, it's a different thing, you know, depending on who it comes from and what the, the, the context is, mm -hmm. right? So context, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the context. We accept certain things from people while, because we're familiar with those people and we're okay with those people and we know that they don't mean, mean it to be insultive, but we're not so sure about the other person. And so mm -hmm. it makes it a lot more difficult to accept. The topic, Mr. Campbell, that we're discussing today, racism, is not a topic that is easily, easily talked about. And whenever we have the conversation about racism, it is always in its negative format. And so it's heated conversation, and it's never sitting down to talk about what really this is all about, you know, mm -hmm. and see how we can get by with all of this. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the whole notion of doglerization. <laughs> so for our history talked about the, the blacks and the Indians against each other for a long time. And then our um, more recent population is more of, of a mixture, with, which means that the, the two ethnicities are cohabiting or living and, and their families and all of that. And so we have Douglas children within the whole context of Ghana and racism. Let's talk a little bit about dollarization. All right, so there are those people who feel that that will fix our problems if we could cross-pollinate, if you, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, if we could um, have biracial relationships and, and produce a lot of biracial children, then they can't choose one side or the other. Mm -hmm. um, but experience has shown that that is not the answer to the problem of racism. Uh, because if, for example, I um, am biracial, yes. and my mother is one ethnicity and my father is another, but for some reason I am more connected with my mother's side of the family, mm -hmm. then I could identify as her ethnicity. Okay and dislike people who are of my father's ethnicity, probably because of, a, of, of an issue that I have with, with my father, yes. or, or, or with people, with, with, you know, or, or what I was taught, mm -hmm. whether wittingly or, or, or um, unwittingly, mm -hmm. about people of my father's group, because you know, I could love my father and yes. still hate people who look like him, yes. um, because I could convince myself that my father is one of the few good ones. Right. You know? Yeah. So, um, dollarization is not going to be the answer. It's not going to be the answer. I, I know of people who are half Indian, half black, who hate black people, or half Indian, half black, who hate people of Indian origin. Mm -hmm. 
what we are going to have to change is our culture yeah. and our mindset and you know the the, the thoughts the, the the values that we teach our children that is what has to change because you know what we look like on the outside um, that is not going to fix it. I've heard people who are people who are darker than me have called me black man in a very racist way, you know. And, yeah. and I remember once asking a guy, "Look at us, come on now, who, who is the black man here?" <laughs> but you know, so the the, 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 the skin color is not mm -hmm. is not going to fix it. The hair texture is not going to change it. It's what is inside that, that that has to change. We have to use education, and therefore we have to have discussions like these. We we have to talk about it. And we have to talk about it, about it in its purest form, not, 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 not nicest form, yeah. but it has to be undiluted mm -hmm. so people can express these hurts and these prejudices and these biases that have been, you know, that have been, you know, imparted to us over generations. And we, gotta, we have to examine these things and then choose a different way of relating to one another. Excellent. That is deep, Mr. Campbell. I want to encourage our viewers and our listeners. Mr. Campbell is touching on a very important aspect of our work, education. And so if you feel that this is something that is near and dear to you and you want to reach out, and it's not something you can discuss with anybody, the Department of Social Cohesion is here. We are here to listen, and we would love to have your comments. We have touched on racial stereotypes, and we have touched a little bit on dogularization. Social cohesion um, aims at strengthening our relationship at a community level. And all that we've talk, talked about this morning is our ability to relate and how we see each other. Mr. Campbell, within that context, let's talk about um, racism within a political leadership sphere. Let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about racism and political leadership within local government in Guyana. All right, so let me start with uh, a, a personal example to make the point that I want to make about political leadership. Now, before I had children, there were some things that I used to do, I used to enjoy doing. Um, the moment my first daughter came, I knew that as much as I enjoyed these things, mm -hmm. I had to make some adjustments because I didn't want my daughter to get the wrong message. Um, I think that as political leaders, there are some things that we have to be very cautious about because there are people over whom we have a lot of influence who might get the wrong message. So I, political leaders, in, you know, in, in leaders in general, and political leaders in, in Guyana's context have to be very careful about how they conduct themselves and how they deal with people so that people, you know, the wrong message is not sent. Because very often we have leaders who are not necessarily racist, but because mm -hmm. they are racially insensitive, right. people get the impression that the message is a racist one. And so, I th when you reach positions of leadership, you have to be extra careful mm -hmm. about your messaging and you know, you know, how you say what you say, not just what you say, but how you say it as well. How you do what you do. Um, so, you know, the, as leaders, leaders have a, 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 a greater role, a greater responsibility than mm -hmm. the average man in the street to, to send a message of cohesion and, togetherness and, 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 and unity. Excellent. Um, that brings us to discussing roles and responsibilities at a local government level. We know at a local government level, um, primary function is to build cohesive communities. And we have been going around this dear land of ours in all 10 administrative regions talking to people about how we build individual relationships and community relationships and how that leads to better family and better communities and better nation. Tell us or share with us some of the qualities of the 
political leaders at, at that local level that will encourage um, building better communities? At the very root of it, at the very foundation, I think our leaders need to be focused on building their communities. So it should be an, uh, you know, a, a, a policy of community first. Yeah. So whatever is going to improve my community, whatever is going to benefit the widest cross-section of community members, um, whatever is going to bring to, to, to improve the standard of living for the people in my community, that is what I should be promoting. And that should not, you know, what I promote, what I support, mm -hmm. what I should not depend on which group is coming from yes. or, you know, who is behind it necessarily or where the idea came from. Mm -hmm. that, that, that should not be a consideration at all. If it is going to benefit my community, if it is something that we can do that will make everybody else better off, then that, then that is what we should focus on. So, you know, if our leaders can take that approach, we had, we've had quite a bit of, um, we've, we've had a number of situations where projects could not get done, for example, because, you know, certain, some people felt that it, it, the, the idea came from the wrong place. Yeah. Um, those, that should not be our consideration. If it is going to make our, our, our community better, that is what we need to support. That is what we need to promote um, from, from the perspective of, of leadership. Um, so, I, I, again, I, and I think we mentioned it in, the, in, in, in another, in, in a previous episode on this topic, as leaders, we have to become unselfish. Yes. And, you know, not focus on what will keep us in the chair, but focus on what will promote development. That is, that should be our focus. A people what focus. Will, it, it has to be a people focus rather than a party focus. Now, I can say this, I, I, I'm not a public servant, so <laughs> I, and I have a little more latitude, a little more liberty to say what I want to say. So, you know, we have become so tied up with politics. Mm -hmm. Right now, the lines between race and politics are, blur are blurred. True. And um, it's, not, it's not good for our communities. Mm -hmm. And it's not even good for politics, really. Mm -hmm. um, it's not good for our nation. And so we have situations where people are told, don't support this because those people... Yes. It came from those people. Mm -hmm. um, push this because it's going to help these people. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's, you know, this kind of partiality is not helping us at all. It's not helping us at all. So we need leaders who can see community and who can see past color. Not that you don't see mm -hmm. color. Yeah. We, we established that you need to see color. Yes. You know, it's important. But you need to see past that where it comes to community development and national development. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Campbell, it is safe to say that in our communities, as individuals, we are different. As individuals, we have our own strengths. And as a Department of Social Cohesion, we encourage you to bring your differences to the table. Let's see the strength that is within those differences. Put them together. Let's knock out racism from that. If it comes to the table, let's knock it off completely because it's not going to help us to bond. It's not going to help us to live in unity. And so this discussion this morning on racism, we want to have this frank discussion. We want your viewers and listeners to understand if we don't talk about it, it's always going to be that silent killer. It is considered one of the social ills in our country. Um, it's prevalent at this time because some people associate racism um, with politics and it only um, comes up or surfaces during elections time. Mr. Campbell, I know there are some myths about that. Can you shed some light about that for us? Right. Um, I like the way you said it. It only surfaces at elections time. Mm -hmm. Now, for something to surface, it has to be inexistent. 
even mm -hmm. though it might be mm -hmm. below the surface. <laughs> yes. And so that is what happens. Between election cycles, what happens is we put it back below the surface. Uh -huh. We never bring it to the surface and deal with it. Yes. And so it emerges every time there is a conflict, and then we become, again, we, we, we draw on those suspicions and those fears that we had mm -hmm. about other people. So the, it, it, it is a myth, I believe, that we only become racist at elections time. We, we racist all the time. <laughs> you know, we always racist. Yeah. But, you know, we put it on a back burner when we, when we need to borrow rice from our neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we need somebody to watch over our house while we gone out. Uh, you know, when we have our weddings and we like, you know, we want people to come around and mm -hmm. so on. We, we, we put it on the back burner then. Yeah. And then coming down to elections time. Mm -hmm. It comes up to the surface again because we tie our politics to race. So Guyanese politics has been tied to race mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, if we were to talk about the origins of that, it would take maybe an anthropologist yeah. and a political scientist and a historian. I'm none of those things. And much more time. And uh, Yes, you would need a lot more time to do that. But it, 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 you know, it, it comes to the surface, and I believe that some of our political leaders are guilty of exploiting those fears during Indeed. this season. So that you know, you're, you're forced to choose one side or the other based not on policy, but on color. Um, so it, it, it is not a case where it, it, we, we become racist at this time. It, it, yeah. it is a case where it is, we, we get, to use that term again, unmasked. Unmasked, yes. And the, the, what we've been feeling, what has been under the it, it comes up, it rises up again. I think that as a people, we have a responsibility to not let others exploit our racial fears. Yes. You can blame the politicians all you want. Politicians can only do what people allow them to, to do. Exactly. Right? So if, if you know, a politician can make me scared of Indian can try to make me scared of Indian people. Mm -hmm. But if I have reached out to Indian people and, and I have, I, I know that I don't need to be afraid of them because I mean, we all want the same things and so on, yes. then the politician can talk from now till whenever. Right. Mm -hmm. I have already made up my mind about how I'm going to relate to my neighbors who don't look like me. Yeah. Right. So at the end of the day, that decision is with us and we have to stop leaving it, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the politicians, they, 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 they have a responsibility. They should do better. But we yes. can't leave it there. We, have, we also have a personal responsibility to, to ensure that people don't come and tell us things that, that, that are not helpful for our society. Indeed. So, Mr. Campbell, our discussion this morning has been um, very deep. I know we can come back. We will have to come back um, to have deeper conversations on the issue of racism. What would be, in wrapping up, what would be your message to the young people that we have noticed in the last few months being engaged in racial slur, in, in, in really pulling down any person, older person, younger person, what would be your thoughts on, on wrapping up this program? Um, elections last a couple of, the election season lasts a few months. Well, this one exception. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is an exception. This one has been a little protracted. Yes. They last a few months and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. And we still have to live with our neighbors. True. And so we need to move past this whole idea that, that you know, you know we, we need to stop calling each other names. We need to stop stereotyping each other. We need to stop judging each other based on on, on, on race and ethnicity and color. We need to move past that. And I often use the example of other Caribbean country, countries that are multi-ethnic. You have Suriname right across the river there, mm -hmm. um, another multi-ethnic society. Now, some of these societies have been able to progress and improve at a much more rapid rate. You know, we're ashamed of being Guyanese. And, and mm. we travel to all these countries, all these other countries to live because they are better off. And I believe that one of the reasons they're better off is because we're so busy fighting with one another. You can't oh progress yes. when, you, when you, you know, shooting your own soldier in the foot. Yes. 
We need to stop shooting our own soldiers. At the end of the day, all of us have to build this country. Every single one of us has to pull whatever weight that we can manage yeah. to build this country. In our own way. In whatever way we can. We all have, we all have our own strengths. Yeah. And we need to draw on the strengths of every group, every ethnic group, every religious group, every racial group. Ev everybody has a role to play. And so if we continue year after year, election mm. after election, generation after generation, to fight against one another, what we end up with is a broken country that with people who can't contribute to its development because they have to focus on fighting somebody whom they, they, they perceive to be different. If we take the focus of seeing each other as enemies, we can mm. fight common enemies yeah. You know, like like economic stagnation, <laughs> you know, um, lack of education. We can improve our services if we just. But we have to do this together. And you know, I want to say to the younger people, we, we let us stop blaming politicians and stop blaming the older people because younger people do it too. True. Just make sure that as an individual. You were not guilty of that. Take the time to reach out to people who are different from you. Learn about those people. Mm -hmm. You will, I promise you, realize that those people are not as different yeah. under the surface as you thought. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find that you can learn a lot from that person as much as that person can learn from you. And if all of us do this and then we pull together, we're going to have a Guyana, a Guyana that is better for everybody. And, you know, if one side gets rich and the other side remains poor, then that poor side will drain the rich side anyway. True. Let, uh, let's all get rich together then. Yes, indeed. Um, from a Department of Social Cohesion perspective, our vision is to build a unified Guyana. And so you have fed your conversation right into our vision, building a unified Guyana for all to benefit. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell, for an insightful presentation. And I look forward to continuing this conversation on social cohesion in action, racism in Guyana. Thank you very much to our viewers. Thank you very much to our listeners. Thank you for tuning in. Please stay tuned for other episodes of Social Cohesion in Action, Racism in Guyana. <laughs>